We're going to read today from Luke chapter 2, and I'll be reading, as always, from the New Revised Standard Version. So starting off at Luke 2, at verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Now, former director of the U.S. Census Bureau, Kenneth Prewitt, wrote, Mention the word census, and what comes to mind is a dull counting project that governments carry out from time to time. In the U.S. today, you know, it takes on average less than 10 minutes to fit complete the regular census form. Despite that and the threat of fines, many are reluctant to responsibly fill out census forms. Similar scenarios occur around the world. In New Zealand in 2001, 1.5% of the population listed Jedi as their religion in protest of the question itself. Who likes invasions of privacy or imposition of taxes? So Luke chapter 2 opens with a seemingly mundane reference to a census, yet swiftly pulls us into the unfolding drama. About 30 years earlier, Caesar Augustus had ushered in what was known as Pax Romana, a hyped-up headline that promised peace and order, but failed to deliver over the ensuing 200 years. Listen to what Roman historian Tacitus wrote about this. He said the era was characterized as violence, robbery, and rapine, they gave the lying name of government. They create a desert and call it peace. Imagine what it would have been like to live in the Roman province of Judea during this census, the purpose of which was to collect more taxes. This was no 10-minute filling out of a form in the comfort of your own home. Each taxable property was to be recorded along with its value and its owner's name. Now, although Joseph was a resident of Nazareth, the fact that he went back to Bethlehem shows us that he must have still held some property in his hometown. This 90-mile journey was long and laborious, taking them through difficult and dangerous territory, putting both Mary and her baby at risk on rough roads whether they walked or rode on a donkey. As the property owner, only Joseph was actually required to register. He could have traveled alone. But since the circumstances of Mary's pregnancy almost certainly deprived her of the support network that she would surely have needed, it is very likely that Joseph brought her with him precisely because she was in the late stages of her pregnancy. Can we just take a moment to admire the courage and care that Joseph showed Mary by journeying with her through it all? How many, how many people would do that? Stay separated from an awkward situation. He stayed with Mary. He kept Mary with him. And that fulfilled the prophecies. So continuing in Luke chapter 2, verse 6. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. Just like that, Jesus was born. <laughs> I mean, I just love, I love how scripture makes no attempt to make it, to convince us. It's just like, the baby was born, you know. We are not given any other details here, but it's very likely because of the culture at the time that a midwife would have assisted in the delivery. That was a normal practice at the time. And perhaps it was the midwife who provided the cloths 
which were traditional strips of fabric used to keep baby's limbs straight to help them to grow properly. And then we come to a pretty shocking statement, one that has become normalized because we've seen countless depictions of it on Christmas cards. She placed him in a manger. Okay, let's think about what a manger is. It is a feeding trough in a stable or barn from which horses or cattle eat. Now, we have three outdoor cats who are absolutely impeccable groomers. You will never see a speck of dirt on anywhere on their bodies. But somehow they manage to make their food and water bowls really dirty every day, right? So Mary placed Jesus in a manger. I mean, really? This is Mary who... Nancy just mentioned this scripture. I was so glad to hear this. And we prayed it this morning in our pre-service prayer time. The angel had said, greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. This is Mary who had carried and now given birth to Jesus. Mary had the most astounding pregnancy and birth in recorded human history. And she placed him in a manger. I mean, we're so used to it. We don't think about, this is really like, what? (laughs) Yeah, gross. And the one, Jesus, the one whose reign and kingdom was to last forever was placed in a manger. So Tamara introduced, I already, I wrote this sermon before I knew the playlist this week. Thank you, Bart, for scheduling this. Last Sunday, Tamara introduced us to a Phil Wickham song that we sang last week, and we just sang it again two songs ago, whose lyrics phrase this so beautifully. You could have marched in all your glory into the heart of Rome. That's what people were expecting. Showed them splendor like they'd never known. But you wrote a better story in humble Bethlehem. Glory be to you alone, King who reigns from a manger throne. Nobody expected that. And yet, that's what happened. So, in Bethlehem, as in any small town, hands up if you grew up in a small town. Mine was a lot bigger than Bethlehem, but news travels fast in a small town. Luke tactfully tells us not that no guest room was available. He says, no guest room was available for them. It's interesting when we think about the word hospitality. This word hospitality and hospitable crop up a lot in scripture. We are instructed to generously offer hospitality to one another and to prudently show hospitality to strangers. Alan talked about this last week. Hospitality is included as a qualification for receiving financial relief and for church leadership. And we are to gratefully accept the gift of hospitality offered to us. Jesus says, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. And in saying that, he is equating how we treat him with how we treat others. How easy it is to judge based on outward appearances. No guest room was available for them, for Joseph and Mary, because they were judged to be ones who deserved to be despised, excluded, forgotten. Continuing through Luke chapter 2, we're now in verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, 
a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So when we read through the whole Bible, we might conclude that because Moses the lawgiver had been a shepherd for 40 years and King David had been a shepherd in his youth, that shepherding might have been held in high esteem in first century Judea. Unfortunately, shepherds occupied the lowest rung of the social ladder at that time, alongside tax collectors and dung sweepers. Their testimonies were worthless in court, and they were not welcome to participate in social or religious life. Yet it was to this despised, excluded, and forgotten group that the Lord, the angel of the Lord, appeared. As Alan told us last week, the first thing angels often said when appearing to someone was, do not be afraid. (laughs) And that's exactly what happened in Luke chapter 2. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of shepherds or when we think of shepherds, we might think of, we might imagine some idyllic scene where there's contented sheep grazing peacefully in green pastures near a babbling brook. The sun is shining, the breeze is gentle, the lambs are frolicking, the birds are chirping, all is well with the world. Luke tells us that these shepherds were keeping watch over their flocks at night. Now there's no need to keep watch in an idyllic scene. But these shepherds were very much in touch with the real world. They knew that when the sun went down, they needed to watch out and deal with, watch out for and deal with the night shift animals. This is the animals they had to deal with for real. Wolves, hyenas, panthers, jackals, lions, and bears. Many of these are extinct now, but those are the animals that were around in first century Israel. On the rare occasions when I've wandered around in nature at night, especially by myself, I've been startled by every silhouette and sound. (laughs) But these shepherds were not easily frightened. They're used to dealing with these animals. Now the angel of the Lord appeared to them. The glory of the Lord shone about them. They were terrified. The three Greek words used right there in that sentence literally mean they feared with great fear. (laughs) For seasoned and stalwart sheep herders to be terrified tells us something about what angels are actually like. God chose to send the angel of the Lord to these shepherds to bring them good news that will cause great joy for all the people. So the angel's next words are crammed full of significance. Today, in the town of David, A Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. These despised, excluded, and forgotten shepherds got the message loud and clear. Something had happened. That's what news is. Something happened that would change everything. A baby had been born who was the true king, the Savior. Messiah and Lord. God chose to first announce this joy-filled good news, the best news of all time, to the shepherds, the ones who were despised, excluded, and forgotten. You know, sometimes I think we more easily believe God's good news and promises are for other people, but we have trouble believing them for ourselves. God wants you to know today that the good news is for you, no matter who you are or where you've been. 
and then the sign by which they would know that what the angel was saying was true, you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. The shepherds take that matter-of-fact statement in their stride. They knew all about mangers and feeding troughs. Then, suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. So once the angels left, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see. Picking it up in verse 16, Luke chapter 2. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. So the shepherds took off running to seek out this true king, saviour, Messiah and Lord. As shepherds, they were familiar with every manger in town. It wouldn't have taken them long to find the Holy Family. When they saw Jesus, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. These humble shepherds first received the good news of Jesus, saw him with their own eyes, and now spread this good news to others they now realized that this true king, savior, messiah, and lord had been born for them, even as they had been despised, excluded, and forgotten. Not by God, but by the religious leaders, the very ones who were supposed to be caring for and tending their souls. Jesus said in John 13, 34, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Sometimes we more easily believe God's word and God's promises for ourselves but have trouble believing these things for others. Sometimes we have trouble believing God's word for a particular person whom we find hard to love or accept or welcome. Sometimes we have trouble believing God's word for a particular group of people whom we find hard to love or accept or welcome. Maybe our attitudes need adjusting. I know mine does often. Maybe our minds need mending. Maybe our hearts need healing. Maybe we have some forgiveness work to do. Maybe we have some repentance work to do. The truth is that God's good news is for all, which means it is for you, it is for them, it is for us. The good news is that Jesus was born, lived, died, and rose again for you, for them, for us. And we, know, we say this a lot in the vineyard, but it, I, never, I don't think we can ever get, use, get to the end of needing to say it. The kingdom of God has come. The kingdom of God has already arrived, but is not yet fully here. So meanwhile, we get to be part of this kingdom as we love and live, as we participate and pray, as we speak and serve wherever we are. And we told stories today of that. Keep telling stories about that. No matter what we're doing, where we are, we're following Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit for God's glory. So I'm going to finish by reading Isaiah 9, 6, and seven. I'm going to read it in the message translation. It's, it's rendered in a, it's a familiar passage, but this is Jesus, is, Jesus is the prophecy, the fulfillment of this prophecy. Jesus fulfilled this. And he, in this, the message translation, it says, for a child has been born for us. The gift of a son 
for us. He'll take over the running of the world. His names will be Amazing Counselor, Strong God, Eternal Father, Prince of Wholeness. His ruling authority will grow and there'll be no limits to the wholeness he brings. He'll rule from the historic David throne over that promised kingdom. He'll put that kingdom on a firm footing and keep it going with fair dealing and right living, beginning now and lasting always. The zeal of God of the angel armies will do all this. Let's pray. Lord, help us never to get over the wonder that you came for us, for them, for each one. There's no one whom you did not come to save. There's no one whom you've despised, excluded, or forgotten. Lord, would you let the truth of your good news, the good news that Messiah has come, Emmanuel, God with us, would you let that truth sink deep into our hearts and our minds, that we would receive the good news for ourselves, that we would receive the good news for those around us, especially for the ones that we think are beyond the reach of your grace or your love, whether it's someone we know who's hurt us, someone that we've prayed for for decades and we don't see any change, Lord, you are always doing a good, holy, and beautiful work in each person, whether we see it or not. Lord, help us to to reach and to continue to love and pray for groups of people that we find hard to love. Lord, we all have blockages in our hearts. Would you come today, clear those blockages out? We have judgments in our minds. Forgive us, Lord. Would you forgive us? Forgive those around us. They don't know what they're doing. Forgive us. We don't know what we're doing. We are in need of your grace. Help us to follow you, Jesus, when it's hard, when it's sunny, when it's rainy, whether we're content or discontent, whether we're anxious or at peace, whatever's going on, help us to keep our focus on you. Lord, as several have said today, you see us and you call us to see others with the same love the same grace, the same welcome and acceptance that you see us and every person with. So Lord, we invite you and we welcome you to change us from the inside out, that we would be better conduits of the grace and love of God. Thank you for the love that abounds here at Liberty Vineyard Church. We're small, but we truly love one another. It's a good thing going on here because it's the body of Christ. It's the family of God. Thank you and we praise you. But we open our arms to receive whomever you send. We welcome whomever you send. Help us to be good news bearers with the way we think and speak and live for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.